Uh, you know, that was... Um... Well, I remember hearing a story of, uh, you know, an area in Port-au-Prince where, um, you know, there hadn't, there hadn't been uh, uh, much attention in terms of uh, the relief, you know, the food and water. And the reality was the leaders in that community were saying, we have water. We have access to a well, <laughs> right. and we have a water truck that mm -hmm. could distribute, we need fuel. Mm -hmm. So instead of, you know, one of these big organizations like Oxfam or someone, you know, trying to get all this water into that community, they had water. Right. If they just had made the connection with those community leaders, what are your needs? Mm -hmm. We need fuel. Well, there's just been a gross misunderstanding. Um, and it goes back to the view, like you said, of, of these people as people in great need without recognizing their resources. And there needs to be dignity even in a crisis, you know. Sure. Um, we were working with this team of 17 doctors from, from Delaware, and they kept seeing all these children who were malnourished, like, all day, yeah. malnourished, and I, they were putting IVs in kids because they, they were dehydrated. Yeah. And finally, we asked the owner of the property, well, where, the, where they would let them set up this clinic, so well, where are these kids coming from? Like specifically, where are they coming from? And she said, I'm so glad you asked, let me show you. And she took us by the hand and led us up on top of the hill behind the clinic. And there was a, t there was a, there were 125 families, 300 people living under a borrowed tarp. And, and they, you know, and we came up there and people were just happy to see us. Yeah. There was no fear for security. No. Nah. They were happy to see us because we actually went and spoke with them. Yeah. And, uh, and they told us their story. They said, you know, we're under this borrowed tarp. The guy who loaned us the tarp is mad because we put holes in the sides, see, where we made the, the sides, and uh, to, to make sides to it because the water just keeps, every time it rains, the water comes flooding through here and people are laying on the and ground. And nobody knew they were there. Nobody except knew they were there. The people dealing with them. Exactly. Uh, the doctors. And the day that we, and they didn't know they were there yeah. they were, because they were hidden, they were off the road. They were back up on the hill. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, so, and they said, you know, we haven't had we haven't had food brought here in five days, you know. And people are out in the streets looking for something. They're they're trying to get people's attention. They said, we've gone to every major aid agency. We organized ourselves. We have a committee. We have a list of families. You know, there's 125 families, 300 people. There's this many children. There's this many men. This many women. Yeah. We're we're doing this for security for the women in our community. Uh, there were women on their committee to make right. sure that the women's rights were being protected. I mean, that's, that's an amazing yeah, amount of organization. Self, yeah, self-organized uh, uh, relief effort. Mm -hmm. uh, they, just, they just needed the uh, facilitation. When, when yeah. things come, this is, this is how we're going to distribute it. Right, right. They were ready. And they had gone to all the major aid agencies, and none of them had brought them anything yet. Yeah. And well, so they, they, you know what they asked of us? They asked, they, they said, Jeff, could you find three white white doctors, please? Because if, if, if you and I and the property owner and three white doctors went to the agencies, we know they would help us. They would listen. They would listen. Because that would let that would give legitimacy to us. You're right. And uh, that's a big part of the problem that's that's happened. Is, well and uh, that's you know, that's a paradigm. And you know, the cluster that's... meetings are all held in English. So, you know, they don't invite the community or the community leaders to be a part of those. Uh, Decisions are made in a, in, a, in a language different than the nation mm -hmm. that needs to be making the decisions. Right. Can't even communicate. Right. Uh, and uh, so one of the things that, you know, that the organization, the Haiti Response Coalition, is doing is um, both sending animators to help prepare the communities to be able to be respected and understood. Uh-huh. Um, and they're also, on the other side, they're asking the, you know, the UN and the cluster meetings to be held with a translator You're right, and to, to have community representation there. Right. And, you know, I remember, and you pointed this out to me, when General Honoré went into New Orleans. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They had all the press there. They would say, okay, we have, there's somebody new in charge here because it was also a disaster. Right. That, that whole response oh, was yeah. a disaster. Oh, yeah, yeah. And General Honoré got there and he walked right past the press, walked out into the street, you know, and after you told me, I, I looked it up, you know, and he's like, waving his arms saying, put those guns down, boys. These yeah. people are, they're poor, they're not dangerous. Poor, but they're not dangerous. And he started, you know, asking people to organize themselves, and he started using the people, and that was when things kind of turned around in New Orleans, even. I wish you had been able to, I wish you were still young and should, well enough to have gone to Haiti. He, he should have been the, the earthquake uh, disaster relief czar, you mm -hmm. know, to run the show, because 
well, obviously he had a concept, you know, he had a perspective. Um, uh, you know, once again, how you view poverty is going to determine how you respond to it. And, you know, he, he made the point that, you know, we uh, tend to look at uh, poor black folk in mass, in the streets, you know, after a hurricane or an earthquake or whatever, and there's an element of danger here. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole notion that so much time and effort uh, in the initial relief effort was to establish security. Right. And, uh, 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 and, and that and, was mind blowing. You know, here was uh, Sister Mary at the Matthew 25 house. She, and I, I don't know, she looks like she's about a 70 year old white uh -huh. nun from, from the US, I believe. And they immediately turned their their guest house into a hospital. They were doing amputations on the on the dining room table yeah. with nothing but ibuprofen to give people. That was hard to watch because um, it was hard to watch and hard to read. Because I remember seeing you know the trip I made with Pompeii. You know, we stayed at Matthew 25 House, and when I was watching that video on uh, that had been posted on on Facebook, you know, and there was that dining room table, and I was like, well, that's where I sat and ate the meals wow. but then here comes uh, a victim and they're getting ready to perform you know an amputation mm -hmm. and uh, well and the wild thing was that at that point they already had all the medical supplies in the airport but they were waiting for the marines to land security to provide security and meanwhile you know we're hearing reports for work, work from john engel from uh, bell uh, david bell from all these people white people, Haitian people, who've been all over Port-au-Prince. And they say, well, we don't see the insecurity. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, and they told Sister Mary, they said, you know, whatever you do, don't go to Jean Mars, where there's 10,000 people camped out, you know, across from the palace. Right. Because there will be a riot if you go there. And she had eight spaces in her hospital. She had 1,300 people in tents. Uh, she had eight spaces to receive people. And she went to Jean Mars. To, yeah. And she got out. Yeah. And the first people she encountered, she, she talked with them. They said, you know, uh, we, we have a list of priorities here in this little, little cluster of tents where we are. And, uh, you know, and they wanted to tell their stories. This is our daughter. This is our son. Right. This is my wife. This right. is what happened. But according to, to what, what our community has decided, this lady needs help first. If anybody comes for help, she needs help first. Yeah. They helped load her on the van. They helped load seven other people on the van. And she drove away. And they still couldn't get anything but ibuprofen out of the airport. Yeah. Uh, well, then that didn't come out of the airport. And that makes well, me wonder, you know, it's just Haitians at this point are, are looking around and there's so many machine guns and there are more machine guns and armored vehicles in Port-au-Prince. People running around armed I, and there is aid being distributed. And this is two months later and they're still, you know, they're, they're talking about, oh, this has been a very, very successful relief effort. Yeah. Well, not successful if you're living under a sheet and the right. rain are falling every night and your children are sick. Right. And people are still dying. Yeah. I, you know, it's a. I, I don't know. I, I don't understand. Um, it's hard to understand. You know, I was impacted uh, by a, a statement that uh, I read uh, in, a, in a blog post where, you know, someone had said if, uh, addressing the security issue the need to establish security in Haiti for the relief effort and they said you know if you're afraid of Haitians you shouldn't be in Haiti mm. and uh, and I think you know there again it just goes back to uh, you know my experience of, of uh, realizing that I was there as a guest mm -hmm. you know uh, this this is their country right and uh, I'm always I'm always wondering you know, I don't. I'm not so brilliant. I don't have any uh, solutions to things. And to hear the UN in that first week say this is the worst mm -hmm. catastrophe we've ever had to deal with in our history. So yeah, it well, was a mind-boggling concept. You know, mm -hmm. how are we right. going to address this? Because so uh, much help and so many resources have been spent in Haiti. I mean, there are, last count, there are over 9,000 ONGs, NGOs working in Haiti, there's so much money that gets spent there. And even now, there's yeah. you know how many billions of dollars have been raised. And so much help has been given in a way that it seems like things just keep getting to worse what effect, and worse. You know? So let's do that in a second, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.